you know, I spent uh, like 10 years writing for the New York Times and uh, like more, more than that kind of writing for Rolling Stone. And if you're a writer, you always have your dream of doing your like journalist anthology. So you save like every article you've done and, uh, and you put it in, I put it into a folder called like anthology. And I figured that, you know, when the time came and it was right for it, I'd do my kind of journalistic anthology. And, uh, and what happened was, so I started collecting pieces. I remember like in, like my first big break was going to Seattle in 94 and like covering Kurt Cobain's suicide. And it was an intense thing for like a young, uh, guy to be. So I, so I put that in there. And then my second thing, uh, the, the other stories I started putting in is, uh, even before the game and the game, uh, even though Emily kind of said it's more of a how to pick up girls thing, it's really what it really was to me was a book about, you know, male insecurity, you know, and my own insecurities and fears. And but before the game, I realized when I did this book is uh, I spent six months for The New York Times going like undercover as a stand up comic, trying to make it as a stand up comic. And the reason I had them made them give me that assignment is I wanted to get over like my nervousness. I wanted to get over stage fright. I want to get over social anxiety. So even like kind of pre game, that was, an, you know, my kind of first attempt to do that. So anyway, I saved all these in a folder, and uh, and my last book after the game was such an intense experience. It was called it was called the Emergency, and it was kind of based on all the 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 shit that is good that was going on and is still going on with like the economy and natural disasters and and uh, and everything we've kind of seen happen in the last <laughs> kind of scary last eight or so years. So and for that book, I basically was the game was an intense kind of two two year experience, and this one was like kind of overlap with the games. And it was two years of learning how to be self-sufficient, learning how to get off the grid, learning how to basically like recreate civilization on my own uh, with no one else. So it was such an intense experience. I thought maybe now's the time to take a little break. I told my publisher, give me two months and I'll put together this anthology. So I opened up that little folder with all those articles and I started reading them. And I'm like, you know what? These kind of suck. <laughs> like they weren't that good. <laughs> like I thought all along they'd be like holed up in a book. And I realized, you know what? They, they, they weren't as interesting as I kind of thought, as I thought they were. And, and uh, I ordered a bunch of anthologies by other writers and I read them and all of them. Like it's, it was just hard to read a book front to back that's a collection of random articles written over time. And also you kind of just get tired of the writer's voice after a while. Like do you really want to read a profile of, you know, Tom Cruise written 10 years ago to promote a movie that we all forgot about. So what I decided instead was, was that I would get all the, all the cassettes of all the interviews, all the transcripts and all the recordings and the, uh, of every interview I ever did. And I had them all like retranscribed and I had them retranscribed by like a medical transcriber. And I told her like, I want everything. I want like every cough. I want every pause. I want uh, every, every change in tonality. I want every, uh, uh, every interruption, every background noise, I want any, everything. So I got, you know, 20,000 plus pages of all these cassettes. And this, by the way, this two months turned into like two years. <laughs> so, and, uh, and it turned into these, and I would look for like these little moments of authenticity. And, and that's kind of what we'll talk about today, which is your, my kind of goal as a writer when I go and do an interview, especially if it's for like Rolling Stone or the New York Times, uh, it's, it's, I'm not just going to spend an hour in, in a room with a person. I'm usually going to spend like a week, a day, a week, a month, in one case, like a year embedded in someone's life. And I'm looking for the moment where like the mask falls and I get to see who that person really is. And then, and that may not be a, that may, may not be like a traditional sort of interview moment. Uh, for example, when I was interviewing Motley Crue, the moment where the mask fell, I think was like one of the moment I met them and they were like getting arrested. <laughs> and like as, as they're walking, led away in a, in a, Handcuffs. It wasn't just that Nikki Six and Tommy they were getting arrested. The moment that showed me who they were was that Vince Neil was like kind of blow drying his hair the whole time. And I thought, okay, that's the, that's the moment. And then even better, like two fans kind of ran up to them with the copies of Shout of the Devil and tried to like get them to autograph them as they were walking out. Like that's how used that's how used to it the fans are to seeing these guys get arrested. And others were like, you know, so I found so I collected all those moments and went through this whole long process to kind of find the moments in the book. And uh, and the good news is, uh, as I was pulling up in the car, I just found out from um, from my editor Harper Collins that it made the New York Times bestseller list. So I'm really excited, yay! For... <laughs> which is which again is so awesome for an anthology. And so what I thought I'd do is, I just read a short thing and then I go over sort of some lessons that we kind of apply to our lives. And uh, these these so these are things. So even though on the surface it seems like the book's about celebrity, to me it's just about people. Like I feel like I could stand on any street corner, interview people for a couple months, and come up with something as interesting as this. So, um, well, I'll tell you what we can we can read we can read one of two things that I can read to you. This 
uh, when I spoke last time I did this. I, I'm trying to decide which one. I can, I can either read, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll do, either read A, things I've overheard in my dangerous neighborhood in New York that I kind of wrote down. Read that, I'll read that. Okay, I'll read this. I haven't read, I, haven't read, I didn't read these last time, so. Um, th- so these were in the book and I found it interesting. Like I just take notes on life. I write nonfiction because it's more interesting than anything I can make up. And, uh, and so I used to live in the East Village in New York, but like before it was like kind of cool and funky when it was just like dangerous. <laughs> and I remember like, like one time walking home, like three guys just like started kicking the shit out of me. And then, then they left. And what was scary about it wasn't just that they beat me up, but that they did not take my money. <laughs> like the whole go, like it was just random. If they took my money, I would have felt better about it. It was, it would be a goal oriented you know, behavior. <laughs> Instead, it was just violence for the fuck of it. Um, so, and then when I heard like a couple of people getting like uh, held up at gunpoint outside my, outside my window, I figured, you know what, time to, time to move out. But before I moved out, I collected these, these sayings. And for those of you guys who haven't been to, the, to New York in the East Village, of course, as soon as I moved out, like six months later, there are like velvet ropes and nice restaurants and clubs there. But, uh, but how it works, obviously, New York's on the grid system and their number, the streets are numbers and the avenues are numbers. But as you go further east, they go le- turn into letters. And the higher the letter, in this case, the worse the neighborhood, the worse the block. So this is over on Avenue B, two men talking. Just because I killed someone doesn't mean I'm an expert. <laughs> and on the same block, a man talking to a woman, I'm not a jealous guy, I'm just violent. Like, sounds like a keeper right there. <laughs> on East 7th Street, a guy saying, I'm going to break your face, sucker, to a lamppost. Or maybe, maybe it was me, I don't know. Um, I over this at a rave. Uh, and the last thing he did was drink a glass of orange juice. Now he's in a mental institution and he thinks he's an orange. <laughs> Imagine the last thing he did was take a shit. That would have sucked. <laughs> On Avenue A, two well-dressed white men talking. I'm not a racist or anything, but have you ever beaten up an African-American? And like that's gonna make it okay if he uses the right PC term. <laughs> and then there's this bar 7B um, and uh, two women talking. He's a total fox, so I love him but he completely has no personality and doesn't speak a word of English. So I took to running around the East Village in a fox outfit, didn't work. And this is over on Avenue D, so way east, two guys talking. I don't take a life, I bury a soul. I don't know what that means, but it's scary as fuck. <laughs> and, then, and then what I thought I would do, since you guys are here and I actually have to do like a, a book reading tonight, is uh, when I was in New York, I started collecting like a list of things that I've like never heard people say ever. And what I thought is when I went to my reading tonight, um, do, you, do you ever like a regular pen? When I went to a reading tonight, I would write down a list of things that I've never heard in San Francisco. So you guys would, it would be a collaborative effort so I could do this in my reading tonight. So I'll give you a couple examples to get your minds going, working. Yeah. And uh, so these are a few things. And these, the, these are a couple that would apply to San Francisco. So these are things I never heard in New York. Um, no, go ahead, take the parking place. You were here first. <laughs> that, that, that would not be heard in San Francisco, I think. Um, thank God the police are here. Never heard that. Oh yeah, will you look at that? My bike is still here. Um, are you Neil Strauss, the famous writer? Never heard of that. Um, so are there a couple others I can add for San Francisco that would be like specific? Things that you we would never hear in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. Or nice sun. I like your love your suntan. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll work on that. We'll work on. We'll do that one. I love your son, Dan. Much too early for one. <laughs> That's good. Yes, I am a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Uh, I've been searching all day and I can't find a Chinese restaurant. No, Would that yes or no? I don't know. Maybe. What's that? I can't find a Thai restaurant. Uh, okay, we'll go off those. If you think of any others, just yell them out when I'm speaking later. What's that? I can't find anywhere for brunch. What the hell is Burning Man? Yeah, what the hell is Burning Man? That's a good one. I love the nightlife here. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good. Okay, awesome. Done. That was quick. Good job, guys. All right. So here, here's the here's the. So I'll give you a choice of what we're gonna do next. We'll do one of two things, and we'll do some questions and answers. Um, especially because I know we started late. So choice one is 
that once I, once I went through all these interviews in the book and, and put them all together, and with the benefit of kind of 2020 hindsight, you start to see like themes that emerge through them and like themes of lessons that you can kind of learn for your own life. And I thought it was really interesting. And there were a lot of like kind of surprise, some were kind of intuitive, some were counterintuitive. And there were interesting like themes that I learned that to me, like I think about all the time that in terms of my behavior, that like there's lessons in the book that I've like directly applied to my behavior or try to apply. Um, in fact, one I should be applying right now. Uh, and then there's another one, then that's choice one. Choice two is, uh, so there, there's education, or then there's humor, which is, obviously, I did that book, The Game, which which means that for the rest of my life, I'll be getting the most insane emails <laughs> probably most almost anyone ever gets. So, and I collected like a bit, I collected like the funniest emails. I'll, I'll give you a small example, because this one's, I didn't even write down, because I just got it today. It was a guy writing saying, um, oh yeah, he was saying, I uh, have a question. I'm 27 years old. I'm a virgin. Uh, you know, a few girls said that if I would pay for their, um, that if I would pay for their uh, uh, breast implants, they'd let me touch them. Do you think I should do that? <laughs> so they're along, they're along, they're along those, they're along those lines. So humorous emails, educational life lessons. What do we feel like? Emails. What's that? Life lessons. <laughs> Who said emails? <laughs> All right, we'll do the life lessons. That'll end with two emails. How about that? Okay, so you're pretty good with your life, is what you're trying to say. <laughs> I felt like it would have given me a good like temperature of the company and people as well, because everyone's for like emails. It means like we, we work too hard, we think too much, just entertain us. And if everyone wants life lessons, it really means like you know we want to get out of here at some point in our life and do something else. <laughs> so here are life lessons. You don't have to comment on that. If you laughed, you've all been recorded. Um, so first, first one. And this and it was was uh, the first lesson was really let go of the past. And what was amazing when I did these interviews, and I interviewed people like Chuck Berry, who like invented rock and roll basically, and Bo Diddley, who and Jerry Lee Lewis, and these guys who left like such a huge legacy on on, on music. And it, here are these guys who like are almost afraid to go outside, who think everybody hates them because of some scandal that happened 30 years ago. And so like the lesson from that is uh is that literally we've all had shitty things happen to us in the past. We all have uh you know whatever it's a relationship or a parenting thing or a scandal or a, you know, some humiliation, something that didn't work out and you deal with it the best you can in the moment. And then you have to let go and move on. And the crazy thing is that all the shitty things in the moment, like enrich you later, not just as a person, but actually to other people. And you'll see in the book, like I was trying to explain to Chuck Berry that, yeah, maybe when you transported a minor across state lines for immoral purposes, that was bad at the time and you went to jail. That's true. And then at the time, it like really did hurt and destroy your career. But the crazy ironic thing is, although that may st that it is still wrong, it actually just makes you more interesting to people now. No one's judging you for it any anymore. It's just a story now. Um, and I th and and I think if like that's true for that, then most of what a lot of what we've been through is it becomes that too. So letting go of the past and focusing on you know focusing on being great at what you would enjoy, and uh, and being glad for your accomplishments is is is, is important. Um, next next one is and this is uh, this is definitely true on the a West Coast thing, which is that that fame and wealth won't make you feel any better about yourself. <laughs> Because I see so many people, and especially in LA, like trying trying to feel feeling like if they get famous or if they get a lot of money, that's that's going to fix all their problems in, of insignificance, of insecurity, of worthlessness, and disconnection. And of course, like the re the real lesson is that that rather than fixing one's problems, like you know, the more fame and the more wealth, like magnify them, and those little things that aren't a big problem in your life become huge and and that's what we get to enjoy on the front page of the tabloids and watching Charlie Sheen and 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 everything else and and the corollary to that then is uh you know fix your problems now because the older you get the worse they'll become and i have this fear like cuz i was talking to a friend of mine a, a producer uh, for you guys who read Rules of the Game, I don't, don't sure, not sure if guys read it, but I have a conversation with this producer in the front and the back, this kind of anonymous producer, and he's kind of my uh, a good mentor. And we, I was telling him that I started this list on my computer, and the list is notes to myself as an old man. And they're basically like things I need to watch out for when I'm older, because when you get older, that thing that keeps you in check is going to start to turn off, and you're just going to, all those sides of yourself you try to try to repress are just going to come out. <laughs> and then the notes are things like, don't be paranoid. Everyone's not out to get you. They have better things to do than worry about an old man. <laughs> so things like that. And he said, you know what? Instead of just writing them down now to read later, why don't you just fix those problems now and then you won't have to worry about them at all when you're older. And I thought that was really kind of wise advice. Next thing, this probably applies here, is that 
the people I've interviewed who've gotten really, really successful by working really, really, really hard are pretty unhappy people. Um, and the people who, you know, party all the time with tons of girls and drugs and all that kind of stuff are not only end up unhappy, but usually in jail or dead, or in, at least in rehab. And the, and, the, and the people that I've interviewed who are sort of, are sort of like the happiest, the ones whose lifestyle you may say, okay, you've got a good lifestyle, are the ones who found like balance at some point. And so I really believe like the, you know, that the secret to happiness is, is balance. Um, and, and devoting some amount of your life to work, some amount to, you know, to family, love, relationship, some amount to doing something physical and healthy every day, some amount to contemplate a time for yourself. And you can kind of keep that in balance, you know, then you're okay. Even if you're going places in your work and you're doing awesome, like you're just, you're, you're not doing well if you're out of balance. And I feel like I just did a Howard Stern cover story for Rolling Stone. And what was interesting was that, you know, the last question I asked him was, you know, you're on radio, two radio stations 24 hours a day. You got your own TV station, so you're on TV 24 hours a day and no one's bored. You know, you got a great wife and a happy relationship. You make more money than even like the late night talk show hosts. You know, why are you still unhappy? <laughs> you know, and that was the answer that, that, that there's that anger and he's, and he never worked on it and, and, uh, you know, and he's only just now trying to discover and trying to find balance. So I felt like it's it's a it's a hard thing. It's easy to know, but it's really hard to do in our lives, especially like at our ages. Uh, and and one one other correlate I meant to add is to uh, to the fixing your issues now thing. I do think like one of the one of one of the goal. I really feel like one of the goals in life is that when you're when you're young, you, you're handed a, like so let's just say from age one to th- twelve or something, you're handed a certain amount of issues by your parents. You know, even if you have good parents who love you, they still get a certain amount of issues, as well as your kind of social group and things like that. And you get a certain amount of baggage. And if and I think the goal, one of your goals in life is to try and, you know, recover from that baggage, divest yourself of it, so you can kind of become the kind of clean, great person you were when you were born and return to that, not in a new age way, but deal with that baggage and let go of it and kind of kind of be happy again. I really feel like that's that's one of the goals of kind of evolving through life outside of the, you know, the family and love and uh, thing. And that if someone once told me that when someone's on their deathbed, they never think about, uh, shit, I didn't finish that book or uh, I didn't finish that project or, um, you know, I didn't finish that album I was making or anything. They always think about family and love. And you'll see at the end of the book, it's kind of, it's kind of a thematic things if you guys read it. And the last section is about, uh, about, uh, about death. People who are close to, to, to dying or thinking about death. And I was really struck and I don't, and I never, I still don't fully understand it, but I was always really struck by it. There's a bluegrass musician named John Hartford, and uh, he wrote a song called Gentle on My Mind, which was a big hit for Glenn Campbell and one of the most recorded songs. But what was interesting about interviewing him was he had, uh, I think he had leukemia, and he knew he had like maybe a year or two left to live, and that was it. And he had chosen in that time to get better at playing the fiddle. That was all he was going to do. He was going to sit at home. He would play the fiddle. Other pickers would come over. He'd record it, play it back, and try to get better at the fiddle. And he was just really happy with that choice. And it was just a, like an amazing, beautiful thing that I still can't really understand in my head because, of course, no matter how good you get, <laughs> you know, at one point you're, you're going to obviously be gone and none of that's going to matter. But I just thought that he made his choice. He was happy with his choice. And and I, and I still have yet to really fully understand the significance of, of that choice he made. And it was, I, found it, I found it really fascinating. Versus... Rick James, who his last words to me when I interviewed him were, he, I said, what are your plans for the new year? He said, my plans are to leave that motherfucking cocaine alone. And, and of course, he dies a couple of years later of a heart attack with cocaine in his system. So there's a guy who never got to you know, make his choice and live it for what he was going to do with life. So I'll give you a couple other really quick ones. Uh, I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal about one of the kind of more surprising things I found in this book, which was that musicians who believed in God and that believed that God like had a plan for them to be famous. It was God's plan for them to be famous, you know, became more famous and got to stay there longer. And it doesn't mean, and I don't believe this is a religious belief. Obviously it's, you know, some sort of delusional narcissism that, you know, <laughs> that you're chosen out of everybody by God to be famous. And he even fucking cares if you have a billboard number one or whatever, you know, I always get all, like when those, like with every Super Bowl, the guy who, the fucking team who wins, and I don't really watch much sports, but the team who wins and the, and the MVP, every fucking Super Bowl is always like, this was God's plan. Like God is sitting there fucking watching the game, you know, <laughs> like, like, like that's going to matter for the fate of the world <laughs> that that team wins. Um, and I suppose in chaos theory, maybe it would, but anyway. Um, but the point being that the, versus the musicians I interviewed, 
and and I, and I think the reason why it works is this: is if you're if you're on a level, and one of the reasons I named the book "Everyone Loves You When You're Dead," is as you're getting as you're as you're improving yourself, if you're if you're sticking your head out, if whether you're you're rising at the company, whether you're a guy who read the game and you're doing better with women, anytime you're doing better, everybody's gonna start to shit talk you and take you down because your success makes everybody else feel worse about themselves. And that's why we love shit talking celebrities. We don't shit talk homeless people, you know? <laughs> like we love shit talking celebrities because they're up there and wanna say, like, hey, they're no better than us. Look at them, they're they're fat, they're thin, they're falling apart. Look at them. They suck, <laughs> you know? So, so to, anyway, just to be there and withstand all the things being thrown at you, I think if you're like, okay, everybody hates me, but God's on my side. So fuck you all. You know, you can have that strength to go through it versus people I interviewed like Jack White, uh, who had a lot of insecurity and doubt about where they were. And Hey, not everyone's goal is to be famous. I'm just using, so, you know, I think it's better to be a great artist personally, but the people who had a lot of fate, uh, doubt and insecurity ended up kind of not staying there because it's hard. You, you don't, you don't make choices that are good for you because you're worried about what everyone else will think. Um, so a couple other, I'll do them really quickly. A couple other lessons. One is, uh, you know, derive your self esteem from within, not from others opinions. And I think that almost goes without saying it's a corollary of that, but it's amazing how we meet these people who recorded these seminal albums, you know, maybe Brian Wilson and Pet Sounds and them and the people around them are still haunted by the bad reviews it got, even though these albums maybe changed the course of, uh, of music. Uh, <clears throat> next one, I'll do this one really quickly, which is, uh, never say never because everybody I've ever interviewed who's ever said at the, as they're up and coming, I'm never going to move to Los Angeles and start dating a model. I'm not going to be that cliche has done it <laughs> with to the, to the letter. And often the, the, the things that you say that you say no, never about that. I'm not going to do that, uh, because that's so cliched are usually often cause I, cause you're envious of it. Or because uh, if you know the Jungian idea of the shadow, the shadow is a side of yourself that you don't like. The shadow is a side of yourself that you want to get rid of, that you don't want to show to other people, that you wish wasn't there. Just the secret side, you you, you try not to show anyone. The reason you don't want to be on a reality show because that side's going to come out. <laughs> so the shadow, and when you ever meet somebody and you have an instant dislike to them, you just meet someone for no, no reason, you just instantly dislike them. The reason you have that emotion is either envy or it's you're seeing your shadow. You're seeing the side of yourself that you're that you don't like, that you don't want to have, that you want to cut out in that person. And that's why else would you have that extreme reaction to them? Um, next one I think is really important is uh, is like saying yes to everything, you know, within reason. <laughs> saying yes to new things. I see, meet so many people who like sabotage their own careers because they say I'm not going to do that because I'm not getting paid for it, or I'm not going to do, even though they want to do it, it's something they want to do, you know, or they're not treating me with enough respect. I'm, I'm leaving this whole thing, you know, and then the person who takes their place like wins some award or something. And I see that happen so many times. And most of the people who got to where they got to did it by just, you know, saying yes to new things, even, even if they didn't always know what they were, even if they weren't, you know, getting properly compensated when they were trying to get there. And so many people kind of don't do things over ego battles. And one person who I love is Joseph Campbell, the uh, the professor of mythology, and he has two great sayings. Do you guys do you, do you know Joseph Campbell? Does anyone know him? So a few people. He's great, great guy. He studied all of the mythologies of, and religions of the world and sum them up so we can look at our culture and say what our myths are that allow us to kind of keep on functioning. He knows everything about life pretty much. He's genius. But his two great quotes: one is "Follow your bliss," but his other great quote is that the insecure way is the secure way. And, and the meaning of that, it's really, I think, important to, to know, especially at the age we're at, is that, you know, all your life you're told to make the safe decision, you know, to, to, to go get a job, uh, you know, to do something that pays a lot of money, um, because then you're going to be secure. And the thing about that is if you make those choices, either for, for money or for security, you know, if you lose, if you make, say you just work at that job for three, four, five, six years, seven years, and you're getting that money, well, if that money goes away, you've got nothing. You know, you're, you're screwed and there, 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 there goes seven years and you really got nothing versus if you make the choices that come from your passion, the fact is the money probably like won't come, you know, in the first like six months or a year, maybe at two years, you can like feed and clothe yourself, you know, and maybe have a roof over your head. And, and if you're, if you're good at it, maybe over five years, you can finally get to where maybe other people got in a little bit of time. And but the fact is, and I mean, I know for myself when I wanted to write, my parents literally like cut me off financially. I had to cover the rest of like college myself. Um, and I was so broke, but I'd spend my money on culture because I love movies and books and TV and stuff and movies and books and music. So I'd go to like a spend my last five bucks to see a movie 
like at a repertory cinema and like eat like someone's leftover popcorn they left on the seat because I literally had no money. But literally is the best decision I ever made for my life. And the point being this, that if you follow your bliss, if you follow your passion, if you do the thing that you really, really care about, um, and yes, half the people who are listening like will say, well, I don't know what my passion is, but there's something you like and you enjoy doing and you find out if that's your passion. But if you follow that thing and you keep doing it, you can, the money can go. Maybe you never get to that place where you make enough money. But the truth is, like, you, all, you always have your passion. You can lose the money, your passion's still there, and that's fulfilled, and you can be happy with what you've done you know, in your life. People can't take that away. So the truth is that insecure way is really the secure way because that's the most secure place to be. Last lesson is that everyone loves you when you're dead, which, which to me I always think about, and I think it's true, it seems like a flip title that everyone loves you when you're dead, but it's really sort of a, a positive <laughs> message in my mind because if you realize that most of the negative stuff that people say is competition and the only reason they love you when you're dead is because you're no longer competition to them, then they can say nice things. Not only are you no longer competition, but you've been appropriately punished for your success. So if you remember that, it, it makes it easier to walk through life knowing that 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 whatever shit that I'm dealing with is not really going to matter when I'm dead. So my maybe my optimistic message to close this with is uh is uh you know live each day as if you have a fatal disease. <laughs> but really, I I think it helps you make your priorities sort of set. If you if you're John Hartford, you have a couple years left. What are you going to do? And just kind of start doing it now. Uh, so so that's it. That's what I thought I would talk about today. And let's uh we'll do a couple questions. If there are no questions, I'll read a couple of those emails to to kind of close things off. Yeah, and yep. You know, I was told that I could come in and talk about videos and things like that, but like, you guys know more about videos than I know. You guys are probably sick of fucking videos. <laughs> yeah. We never get sick of videos. Um, is, so, that, is that true? Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so I saw a um, I saw a, a, a blog post by you a couple of days ago about dealing with copywriter copy editors. At uh-huh. the, oh yeah yeah yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, the, the New York Times, um, which was which which was really funny. Uh, and uh, I was wondering if you talk a little bit of the ex- uh, the experience of you as a writer dealing with these big publications and having to go through these gatekeepers who can control really word for word what you're saying and how you're presenting ideas and really change those ideas via uh, versus, you know, say as a, like as a, a blogger or someone who is who, uh, someone who's on Twitter where you have control of your own words um, and, and how that's changed for you. Yeah. You know, it's, I think, I think it's, I think it's a good, uh, it's a good thought because I do think that one, you know, one adv- one advantage in the, in the in the sort of blog, you know, make your own video world is that the advantage is, hey, there's there's no there's no, I mean, there is there is some decency stuff, but but really, you you get your idea out there as you want it, unfiltered. So I think so. I think the good side of of say just being a blogger is great. You get to communicate your ideas exactly as you want, at the length you want, how you want, with the paragraph breaks what you want. The bad news of that is you don't get the advantage of having good mentors. Like I can guarantee, I can guarantee it. If I was in that, if I was in that world, I would not be standing today with like, believe it or not, my seventh fucking New York Times bestseller, which is insane. Like I can't even, like I can't even fathom that I've even had that in my life. But if I didn't, didn't have good editors who, who were not just say friends giving advice in your writing, but guys who said, I can't publish this because this is going to reflect badly on the publication in our name if I don't fix this stuff and tell you the rules by which I'm fixing this. If I didn't have good editors who, let's just say, changed stuff, censored stuff. Uh, organized stuff. There's, there's no way I could have written like a book that would be readable front to back. There's no fucking way. So I feel like having those, having good mentors whose, uh, whose reputation is at stake by you, what you're doing, whether it's a, you know, if you're a filmmaker and someone's invested $20 million or something, or you're a, a writer and someone's going to put it in their magazine, like that was so essential to becoming a writer. And, and I agree that some of that is lost now. And especially now, in, as far as journalism goes, it's probably like the worst place it's ever been, which is that you just need to be first with a piece of news. That's all. It doesn't even have to be news. Justin, if you got the fucking scoop that Justin Bieber got a haircut half an hour before some other thing, and you get like 1,000 1, other sources pick that up and link in, and you get a lot of comments, then you fucking succeed. You know, and then you succeed and your editors are happy versus having a unique voice in writing. So I really think we're in this kind of scary place. And I really know, I really know with this new book, what's allowed it to get publicity is – you know, and I've watched it happen, mining out these little tidbits that a celebrity said to these sites, and then watching them kind of take wings all over the all over the internet. And it's been fascinating. It's just been fascinating to watch, like kind of uh, how it works. And then talking to these journalists who are in it's like the, in a horrible place, 
because uh, there's this giant popularity contest going online, and anyone who knows art or culture knows that probably the best stuff is not popular in the in the moment because it's new. And if you're a writer and you're writing something from passion, that's not not going to get as many links as that. You know, Justin Bieber got a haircut, or Charlie Sheen made up a new word thing, where uh, you know where where uh, we're going to get all the incoming links, all the clicks, because they can track it now and say, no, you're not getting enough links, you're gone, and you may be the, even though you may be the best writer there. So I think that's a I think that's I think we're in an interesting moment, but I think that's going to shake out. And what's going to ultimately happen is when everyone has that, when everyone's writing about the same fucking people that we're all sick of already. What was amazing, by the way, and I'm going a long answer, but wasn't it amazing to watch that Charlie Sheen, like, sincerely was saying Warlock and winning and and Tiger Blood, and then within a week he was already parroting it in a video. Like that's how fast our culture is moving now. That that the that the sincere catchphrases become, you know, that you're, they become, you know, parodied in jokes within within a week. It was amazing to watch the speed at which that happened. So I think we're, we're, I mean, obviously, and you guys are part of it, we're really at an interesting moment, transitional moment uh, in our culture. Yeah. Hey, Neil, thanks for coming. Um, I was really curious about the thing you were talking about at the very beginning about the mask falling and building rapport with some of these people that you've talked to. Yeah. Um, not just with celebrities, but like building rapport with anybody, just like your friend or somebody that you just meet right at the first time. And kind of also, uh, I know you could riff on this for a long time, but I'm also interested in this concept of like balance with rapport, like right. where um, like Wayne Elise talks a lot about um, using I statements and like, you know, uh, relating to the other person and, and trying to throw in bits of yourself as you're trying to talk to somebody else. But sort of like, how do you balance that? And kind of like, what are your thoughts on on the rapport building stuff? Yeah. And do you mean a rapport building? I think rapport building is really important. It's important that in this book to me is a lot about rapport building, which is building that connection with people. Um, and do you mean in terms of whether maybe it's an interview because I have certain techniques I do in an interview versus in maybe a one-on-one -on -one situation or, or kind of both? Yeah, both. You're just like what, what do you do when you're with one-on-one -on -one with somebody to get them to sort of open up and like get to see the real them? Yeah, cool. Yeah, I think, I think, the, I think the number one things that, I, that, that apply overall, whether it's uh, – and especially in these interviews and especially in situations where I'm meeting people are being non-judgmental is one of the most important qualities you can have as a person. People who are judgmental – make people closed off because they'll just say things to get them people will just say things to get them to approve of you so being not also being curious coming from a natural place of curiosity to me whether it's with the game stuff and guys were running around trying to start these conversations with people if you didn't come from a natural place of curiosity and really care about what you're asking about and what the person had to say it would go flat and it's same with the interviews and it's same with connecting with someone like i find and I find that curiosity is the most important tool you can have. Like I'll be at a dinner party, it's boring. And I'll just think like, well, what's interesting about that person there? And then I'll start, then I'll, do, I'll pick it out. You know, um, for example, if they're a radio host or something, um, you know, I'll just think, well, I'm curious, like why, you know, a lot of radio hosts I find like, do you ever just not want to go in every morning you have to do it? What if you're like, you find out your wife cheated on you? How do you go in in the morning when you, when you, if you do that or, you, or you've been, there's something heavy going on, you got to be like morning zoo man, you know? And then also if you do that, like guys who are morning zoo man, I'm just kind of riffing on this, but this is where I'll start going is, is I'm not, I, I won't ask anything with an agenda. You know, if I, if you, as soon as you want to get something from someone, they're going to kind of back off. And even if I have an agenda, I'll always let them, them raise it first. So anyway, I think we get the point about curiosity. And natural curiosity is the best way to to connect with someone to start that conversation, as well as being non-judgmental so they're open explaining it. Combine that with deep listening, where you're really listening for what they're saying. And if they falter, you know, if they falter, you know what's going on. You know, and I love listening and listening listening cues. Like if you're in a restaurant and you say, uh, she says a special, you say, how's a special? And she goes, uh, you already know it sucks. You know, if she pauses it's before she tells you it's good, you already know it sucks. So, you know, so like deep listening is important. So when someone's about to pause, you know, you're like, okay, wait, what's the truth behind that? So deep listening, I find, is, is, is the other thing. And soon they forget who you are or what your status is or what's going on. They're sort of like into this conversation. Um, oh, and the other thing I was going to say, if there's an elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room is if I'm interviewing someone, there's a big scandal. If you're talking to someone and it's about, a, you know, you want to raise, you want something from them because they're the higher status person. Let them bring up the elephant in the room. You know, you can lead them toward it. Once they bring it up, then you're just asking the follow-up question. So I always allow if somebody's got a huge scandal, I'll bring it up from that. From either I'll wait for them to bring it up, or if they're not bring it up, um, I'll try to ask questions um, from their point of view. For example, uh, if I'm interviewing somebody and they just uh, whatever the scandal is, instead of saying, "Well, tell me about the scandal or what the public wants to know," I don't care about what the public wants to know. I care about what they're going through, and I'm thinking, "Well, what are they thinking about this?" You know, if you're trying to find out, you know, who they're dating, for example, and you just say, "Who are you dating?" They'll just say, "Well, you know, I can't tell you; it's private." Uh, but if instead, 
you know, because they're not thinking, who am I dating? They know who they're dating. But if instead you say, aren't you like sick of everybody always asking you who you're fucking dating? They're like, yeah. And then they'll start talking about it. And now that door is open. So just finding. So I guess the other skill then besides those would be like, would be, uh, you know, empathy, which is I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think like they're think they're thinking. I'm trying to ask questions from their point of view, not from, you know, what other people want to know. So those are a few things. And if you want one, like one good sneaky thing, it's at trance words and I'll just share that. And it's a cool idea. So this, this is something to apply to people. People have certain words that they like load with, with meaning, right? If somebody says, uh, for example, I was talking, I was doing an interview with Tom Cruise and he's like, I think the word was extraordinary. He's like, man, it was just, it's just extraordinary, you know? And he loads that with meaning. Or when I talk about like your fucking, you're like your passion or something, that's maybe my trans word. People have certain words, they mean something to him. When he says extraordinary, you can't say, wouldn't it be great? You have to say, wouldn't it be extraordinary if we went and did that? Wouldn't it be fucking extraordinary? You're like, yeah, man, it'd be great. <laughs> Which I did. I, I did that with like going, you know, and I also knew like the word peace and extraordinary were important to him. And so, I mean, like it would be extraordinary if you could like show me around the Scientology Center. <laughs> <laughs> And he did. <laughs> so you have to listen for those words. You don't even have to know what their meaning is, but the words they invest with extra emotional meaning. And, and if, if you want to like really be nlp about it, um, is uh, these things are fun, right? Those little things about the personalities. If you really want to be nlp about it, if he's like, it's going to be fucking extraordinary, you watch what gesture he does. You do that same gesture. It's going to be fucking extraordinary to do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you one more really fun one since we're talking. This is one of my favorite ones, too, and I think it's an important rapport thing. Is uh, when we're doing the game, it always goes down in the game because it's fucking interesting. But when we're doing the game, we, we studied from everything to do good. We, we read books on sexuality, on marketing, on everything. But some tips we got, we got from like a book on selling houses. And here are two tips, and they kind of go with rapport, and they also go from getting your agenda um, from a book on selling houses. Two great tips. One is you don't let somebody say no. So if you're showing around the house, and this is the same if you're a guy going for a phone number, this is if you're someone who's like trying to get a, you know, get a job and you're on the fence. If you're starting, if you're showing around the house and you feel like that no is coming, right? You're like, you're like, here's the, here's the bedroom. Do you, do you guys think you're interested and you feel them backing off? You don't back them into a no response. There's a principle called commitment and consistency. As soon as someone says no, they're going to stick with that no, even if they didn't mean it at the time. So you're like, oh, and then you're like, you know what? You guys haven't seen the kitchen. Check out the flooring in the kitchen. And you take them somewhere, you move around, you take them somewhere else. And then you start to see how they feel about it. So if you're getting that no, you just don't let them stay, say a no. You move them around somewhere else, show them another positive feature, and then you see how it's going. Because once they say that first no, they're stuck in that no. Second thing. And this is fucking awesome. So let's just say you moved them to the kitchen. Now they want the house. They've seen all these great features. Now they want the house. Uh, and they say, we want the house. You say, great. You know, uh, I'll prepare an offer for you. What do you guys want to offer? They say, whatever it is, you know, probably in this economy, $200,000. Um, so, you know, they say, they say, uh, they, and you say, great, pleasure. I'll call you tomorrow and you leave. They're going to get buyer's remorse. The mistake is, you know, you got, got along. You had this nice friendship. They trusted you with the agent. And as soon as you got the deal made, you were gone. So the other thing that I learned from selling houses is once you close the deal, you know, you stick around a little bit so they know it wasn't just about closing the deal. And so this was true when you're out, say, getting a girl's phone number. Uh, if you got the phone number, you said, awesome, I'll call you tomorrow for plans, and you left, she was more likely to flake than if you waited and you said, oh, you know, the other thing I forgot to tell you, told another funny story, and then you left, and they knew it wasn't just about closing the deal or just about the phone number. It was about making a connection with someone. So fun question. Well, let's do a couple more because I know my answers are going way too long. Go ahead. I recently read the Patty Swiss book, Just Kids. Just Kids, yeah. And something I thought was, was really interesting was like sort of the, the benefit of the passage of time. So when she was talking about like hanging out with this woman who seemed like kind of interesting, and then it turns out later that it's Janis Joplin and what that really meant, but that her life at the time was just these series of moments and like trying to deal with shit, and then later she can reflect back on the other layers of meaning. And I think that's interesting for your example for Pet Sounds, too. So yeah. when you're talking about this sort of anthology that you're building in this folder and then later you're like oh this told shit on the flip side like have you had any of those moments where like the benefit of time you're like oh actually that was a turning point or this oh for sure and I, yeah i just like to hear some of those sorts of yeah, yeah. For, for me, like the weirdest thing about the anthology was looking, looking through it and realizing that there were specific questions I was asking artists at certain points in my life because I was trying to figure out the answers for myself. Like, and I saw those, these things almost as like therapy for me because I never went to therapy. So I would be asked, like, for example, I can really see my own growth through the book, which I never expected. And I met like from the first interview with Led Zeppelin when I was really young, it was an opportunity to interview like Robert Plant and Jimmy Page. They're like titans of rock. I was really young and nervous. And to me, they were as important as like great, you know, musicians as they were as like guys who had sex a lot. 
because I'd probably at that point I'd sit with like two girls or something. And so I remember like, oh, I could just get asking them questions like about, about at one point Jimmy Page says, do you have any questions for us that don't involve sex? <laughs> <laughs> so, so at that point, I, you know, I was just, I was just a guy who, and then, and later my questions start to turn to like, to work, you know, if you had your choice between, um, uh, what's more important, when you think you've given the world that's more important, the work you've done or your, your children, what's more important? Because I was trying to figure out, I work so hard, but I'm not taking care of family. And then I started asking questions about intimacy, about work avoidance, being, uh, you know, working so hard, being a way of avoiding intimacy. So I can see through those questions that read it exactly where I was in like my journey in life. And even the current like Howard Stern issue in Rolling Stone or the things I'm dealing with, you know, now um, I see in that interview. So those interviews to me, even though I'm just an anonymous guy asking questions, like told me so much about myself and where I was. It was, it was fascinating. This is a cool question. I got to read just kids. Everyone says it's really good. The Patty Smith book. You guys should have her come in and speak. Jen, she's in the book. She says something great in the book. Uh, cause she disappeared for a bunch of years to be a mother and, and she got a lot of shit for it. And she said like being a mother is really the most noble thing you could do. It's a, it's hard, often undignified work, but I'm as proud of that as, as I am of any of my albums and stuff. Cause the public just thinks if you're not feeding us new albums, you're obviously wasting your life. And you know, her answer to that was awesome. Uh, cool. Are there any other questions or I'll tell you what, I'll read you guys two emails to go and then we'll let you guys take off. Unless you have to get back to work. You probably do. Fuck it. <laughs> I'll just read you two emails to get you a sample, then we'll end, end on this. These are the kind of emails that I get in my inbox. Um, Dear Neil, how do I remove semen stains from clothing? <laughs> I don't know why they asked me these. Uh, I asked because I had an unfortunate misfire the other night, <laughs> and I don't want to have to throw these clothes away. I've tried the washing machine with regular detergent, but it's not working. Uh, P.S. I did a search, and I couldn't find anything helpful except using seltzer but I don't know what seltzer is. Can you help? <laughs> so sad, right? I actually answered that. I told this stuff called Zout. It really works. <laughs> Dear Neil, what do you think of psychiatric drugs and jerking off? I have taken Prozac, Paxil, Celexa, Seroquel, Zyprexa, Geodon, and some other shit. Uh, Celexa couldn't make me come, although I finally did jacking off for like 20 minutes straight. What a workout. No wonder my right arms are massively bigger than my left ones. <laughs> like, how many arms does this guy have? <laughs> Do you know, does you know the best medication to take for jacking off? <laughs> um, let's see which one. I'll read you like two more. Uh, okay, there's a, there was an idea in the game called peacocking, which is dressing to stand out for everybody else in some way. Uh, and this guy writes, Dear Neil, I've got an idea for peacocking, dressing up like a monk. No one's ever tried it before, so it's definitely going to get me late. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's going for altar boys, right? <laughs> and this is the most heartbreaking one. Uh, he writes, this is my long-term plan for success. Step one, zero to five years. Increase general social skills and confidence interacting with other people. Also in this time, I hope to lose my remaining body fat, then increase my muscle by 50 pounds. That's zero to five years. Step two, five to seven years. Within this period, I hope to muster the confidence to approach a woman. I think my body and previous social skills will aid in this. <laughs> it makes you feel, but you know, it makes you realize when a guy comes up to you, and if you're a woman listening, like when a guy comes up to you, like you really hold his entire self-esteem in your hands. Step three, seven to ten years. At this point, I will have no fear of approaching women, so I can start to build my skills up. I will practice at least 110 minus X hours a week, with X being the number of hours I'm working. So clearly an engineering student. <laughs> Step four, 10 to 15 years. In this time period, my skills will be getting pretty good. So within these five years, I hope to kiss a girl. I know, it gets worse. Step five, 15 to 20 years. By now, I should be quite an expert, and so we'll be, and so we'll be able to acquire a girlfriend. Step six, 30 to 40 years, die. <laughs> and like, if it's, like the problem is, if his plan's off by a couple years, he's kind of screwed. And I'll read you the last one, which is, uh, Dear Neil, I've just come out of the hospital after trying to kill myself because I read your book. My father wants to kill you. My psychiatrists think you're an evil cunt that cannot even return an email. I want to shoot you in the face. Where do you live? Jason. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for coming out, and thanks, thanks for listening.